All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BXGS Weekly episode 95, the first episode of the year 2020. And uh, yeah, I missed the last one, but honestly, there wasn't really that many things happening because you know the uh, Christmas, New Year, and all that kind of stuff. We don't really have that much stuff today either, for well, exactly the same reason, but. I did find some very interesting things to talk about here for today, so there we go. And uh, before we get started, I guess, uh, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to all of you fellows. Um, you know, I haven't had a chance to uh, do a proper stream or uh, last episode of the year or anything like that, so there you go. Now, with that out of the way, we can get started with our episode 95, which, um, I mean, as I said, you know, it's not majorly big, but there are some uh, things that I want to talk about. Uh, as usual, the first section we got here is getting started. There is some cool things here today. The first one being comparing React testing libraries. Now, uh, while the article itself is uh, pretty interesting and does have a lot of good information here, it's a bit weird as well because it compares testing libraries like uh, Jest and uh, what was the second one? I think they used the uh, Jasmine or something. Yeah, with Enzyme and React Testing Library, which and Puppeteer and then the Cypress, which is like a bit all over the place. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a pretty decent comparison for all of those things. So if you're interested in Jest, Jasmine, React Testing Library, Enzyme, uh, Cypress, and Puppeteer. Do have a look at this article. It will give you a pretty good overview of what exactly they are, how they work, and what the major differences are, which, you know, could be a good starting point. Next article we got here today is JavaScript regular expressions slash G slash Y and last index. Uh, this is a really nice write-up on the difference between the slash G slash Y flags and uh, how they depend on the regex property last index, which is something that I think took me quite a while to pr properly grasp, basically. I mean, regular expressions in general are not the easiest topics to understand. So, yeah, if you are just getting started and if you're still confused about the regexes in JavaScript and you're looking for a good reference to figure out how exactly slash g slash y work and why and how they depend on last index, then do check this one out. It's actually a really, really good write-up. Okay, continuing, we got don't call a React function component. A write-up on how exactly the React function components are constructed and what's the difference between uh, running it via the React create element or just calling the function directly. Uh, if you don't know what I mean, it basically comes down to this. So if you ever written React code, you know that you can write a component just as a simple function, right, that returns a JSX here. And then if you try to map over, for example, an array and pass this as just a function that is invoked on the values, that's not going to work, right? It's going to actually result in a wide variety of errors that can pop up from this. And the reason is because when you call function like this, it's not exactly the same as writing a JSX that would construct this component. So the, you know, the easy way to fix this is basically just to say, hey, uh, take an item and then render it with whatever data and then just render the JSX, right? So the thing is that when you write it with just map, it is effectively the same as writing return counter, which is the function invocation. If that does not sound, um, if you don't understand exactly what's happening is here, right? So then this article is for you. You know, you should read this. It's a very straightforward topic basically, but it's one of those things in React that you just have to figure out for yourself. And when you, once you do, you will, uh, I think you will become a, quite a bit better with the functional components uh, than, well, basically without understanding this very basic core thing about how React constructs the components. Okay, continuing, we got another article from uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier, the simple, blah, let me try that again, simple pluralization via Intel plural rules. So, as we had, uh, I think over the past year, we had like a ton of additions to the uh, intens default browser internationalization API. And some of them I think also shipped in Node. And uh, some of those are immensely useful. For example, the Intel plural rules is this one tiny thing that allows you to do pluralization. God damn, this word is hard. Pluralization using standard JavaScript API without any third party libraries, which is uh, pretty damn good to be honest. So. There you go. If you were curious as to how to use it, it's a relatively short article. It's basically an introduction, but it does show you how to do that, how to use it and how to apply it in uh, real life, basically. So there you go. Okay. 
Uh, next thing we got here is I only use an iframe to crawl and scrape content. Um, write up on using iframes to, well, exactly as the title says, scrape the third party content using just the browser and the dev tools, essentially, in this case, jQuery as well. Uh, nothing super amazing about it. You know, it's just like load the thing in iframe, then parse the iframe, then extract whatever you want from there and kind of scrape like this, which is, uh, it works perfectly fine, right? Now, the interesting thing I found about that is that in the discussion, someone brought up the point that this is how the Selenium worked when it was just built. So if you're curious, like, I don't think that's actually like, you know, this is this is probably the fast and dirty way of, of crawling, obviously, which you can do just by using the browser and DevTools. But if you do proper crawling, there's like a lot of better ways to do that with, you know, Puppeteer and Cheery and all those kind of libs being around. Nonetheless, it's quite nice to know that this exists and how does exactly it works. And also the fact that it's essentially how Selenium worked at the uh, dawn of its, its uh, versions, basically. So it's, it's a bit interesting, yeah. All right, continuing, we got uh, how positive was your year... Blah, was your year? No, what? what? <laughs> God damn it. How positive was your year with TensorFlow.js and Twilio? So this is a basic tutorial for using TensorFlow.js for sentiment analysis by uh, using one of the existing TensorFlow models that basically is trained on, you know, positive negative sentiments. It's uh, relatively straightforward. They also use the Twilio account, uh, but that's not mandatory. Basically, you can create your own data set from whatever the hell you want. Uh, more than anything, this is a tutorial for TensorFlow and using existing models. So if you were ever, you know, wondering about that, how to get started with this, there's actually a pretty good write-up on the topic and also specifically on using the sentiments model, which is uh, very straightforward because it just literally gives you a score. Hey, Kepler, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, continuing, we got an article from Dan Abramov on let versus const that dives into the topic of, well, let versus const versus var. Uh, I think this is very helpful for, well, a lot of people, to be honest. So first of all, if you're just getting started and you're really confused about what's the difference. And second of all, if you've been working for quite some time and you still don't understand when should you pick which. So Dan does a really good work here of outlining the uh, advantages and disadvantages of each of them and when you should actually prefer one and the other depending on your taste again, because in my opinion, this is a very taste-based thing, right? So it's like, it's perfectly fine to use just let. It's also perfectly fine to use just const and then fall back to let whenever you want to do that, right? And um, yeah, so it's it's a pretty good write-up that um, explains why would you use const or why would you not use const? And then yeah, using var at this stage, I think is basically doesn't make any sense because let is just better by any account. But uh, there you go. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Another article from Dan is uh, what is JavaScript made of? This one is, I feel like could be very helpful for beginners. So this is essentially a um, description of a mental model of JavaScript that Dan has in his mind. And there are some very uh, familiar things for me at least because there's some of those that, you know, is, are very close to the way I think about JavaScript. And I think some of them might be extremely helpful to people who are just getting started. Uh, so if you are, you know, getting started and you're confused about things in JavaScript, like scopes and variables and objects and uh, crazy things like this, do check it out. Maybe some of those uh, descriptions will help you sort it out in your head, because this is always quite helpful in my opinion. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is, I think this is actually, yeah, this was it for the getting started section. Now we are coming to the articles. We got three of them today. The first one being an intriguing reason why Node.js libraries aren't promises by default. Uh, this is a deep dive for the people who weren't around, uh, I guess when the Node.js was just created, when, you know, with the JavaScript was a lot worse than what we have today, basically. Uh, because a lot of people, you know, right now, especially the people who just picked up JavaScript in the past couple of years, they ask, why isn't everything a promise, right? Well, why can't I await this? Why can't I just use my promises and chain them nicely, but I have to use some callbacks or whatever? And this article basically dives to, tries to explain why exactly is this the case? And well, the answer is because promises are, well, relatively new construct, to be honest. 
and standardized promises especially because we did have promises for quite some time now i mean it's more than a decade i guess but the problem is they weren't standard there was like a bunch of implementations and some of them had differences and you had to pick and it was annoying and uh, now they are standard right so now you can actually quite easily migrate to promises well there's you know also stuff like performance benefits and other things but this is no longer an issue because the engines essentially optimized for them as soon as they became standard but nonetheless it's a really good write-up explaining why are we not using promises everywhere and how are we basically dealt with the stuff before promises which is callbacks as you might guess so if that sounds interesting and you want more details do check it out it's a pretty good write-up all right uh, next thing we got here is scaling react server-side rendering a really big write-up on, first of all, how the React server-side rendering works in a lot of details, which is really, really cool. So there's like uh, pretty neat uh, graphics here. I, I guess they are hand-drawn because they look amazing. <laughs> and explanations of what exactly happens, you know, with a, behind the load balancer, your monolith, your React service, uh, the JSP pages, the React micro components, micro front ends, and all that kind of stuff load balancing and all that kind of stuff and how does it all adds up with when you add the server-side rendering which is it sounds like an easy task but in reality when you already have an established code base this could be quite an endeavor and making that performant is even harder basically and scaling it to you know hundreds and thousands and millions of uh, responses and requests it can be challenging and this essentially guides you through what exactly happens on every step. How do, how do you migrate to it? How do you introduce server-side rendering? How do you uh, make it work with load balancing strategies and so on and so forth? It's a very big, very detailed and a really well-written article. Uh, trying to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, it takes, I think it took me half a year or something to figure out how exactly it works. So until it finally clicked in my head and I started to kind of understand all the, you know, internal bits, which was, man, this is a tough topic. Anyway, if you are working on server-side rendering in React and you are curious as to how you scale it basically, right, to a pretty large damn infrastructures, uh, at least judging by the, um, the whole description and the complexity that is um, in this article, this is probably your go-to guide. So you should definitely read that. And there, like, it's, it's, it's really, really cool article. So there you go. That's basically all I have to say about that. Okay. Last thing we got here for today in the article section is why Svelte won't kill React. Uh, it's a very opinionated write-up on why Svelte will not, or Svelte, why am I always saying Svelte? Uh, why Svelte will not kill React, which I'm probably, yeah, probably it's not going to happen. Like it's a very good framework. It's a very niche framework. And there are very good points in this article. Like one of them that I found interesting, the way that I have not really thought about it before is that Swell is not actually a framework, but rather a language. While, um, you know, when you start thinking about it, it makes a lot of sense because it's not just a view like single file components. There's a lot more stuff like the reactive operator, subscription to a store and stuff like this, which is something that's not in JavaScript, right? Like, of course, the uh, label operator is in JavaScript, but that's not how it works. Svelte uses it completely differently. So it is essentially a new language, albeit not, you know, too different from uh, JavaScript itself, but still. And uh, there's a bunch of other points. Another obvious, very obvious thing that is uh, introduced here. First of all, I was actually very interesting to see this, uh, the benchmark. So there's the uh, benchmark that compares the performance of Svelte um, on uh, like, you know, the very basic, like creating rows, replacing rows, your typical CRUD app. And yes, Svelte is faster in some cases, but the difference is not that big. Like if you look at the benchmarks, the difference is negligible. It's like, yeah, there's like probably 10, 15%, a bit slower, but you know, then again, it's not too critical. Like, okay, there's one case when swapping rows with 4X CPU slowdown where you can really see this well being a lot faster, but this is like an edge case essentially, right? Uh, the thing is that if you pick Svelte over React over this, marginal increase in performance essentially what you lose is um well first of all there's stuff like typescript support if that's what you 
once basically right this is not something that bothers me for example but i think this point is way more important than well just about anything else right so if you trade this 10 percent performance improvements you lose all this incredible ecosystem react has up to you know right now essentially so there's like 800 packages related to swell and npm and there's 107,000 packages related to react so this is something that you cannot beat overnight and i'm not honestly not sure if Svelte will ever reach this kind of levels of adoption because React has just been like the React community is incredible. Let me just put it this way. Uh, let me have a look at the chat. Pseudo language. I mean, it's yeah, it's kind of it's it's an extension of JavaScript It's sort of like a um, subset of JavaScript, right? Or like, I guess, superset of JavaScript. Uh, so yeah, it's it's still a different language because it introduces its own constructs that are not in JavaScript. And this is kind of the point. Um, happy new year, Kevin. Welcome to the stream. Um, all right. So yeah, but basically if you're curious about the other argumentation, do check it out. I think it's a pretty good arguments. And again, I think the biggest one is essentially the fact that, you know, the react community is just a lot bigger and a lot more mature than Svelte and maybe Svelte has a chance to catch up with it, but I wouldn't bet on it. And I'm not convinced that it, it is basically worth trading 10% of performance improvements to for you know that whole incredibly large community. There's probably are some very small edge cases where you need this 10% performance, or maybe you're using this super slow CPUs that you absolutely must have something faster than React. And then yes, absolutely Svelte will feel at home there, but in most cases it's just not gonna be worth it. Okay, anyway, uh, now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. The first thing we got here is an announcement from the Node Kitten that basically announces the Node releases. But the thing is that uh, as of December 31st, 2019, Node 8 LTS is end of life and you should no longer be using it because it's not going to get any updates, even the critical ones. And you should be migrating to 10 or 12, you know, as soon as you basically can because, well, Node 8 is basically done and there's no reason to stay on it and uh, you know if you have resources migrate to node 12 unless you're using some native stuff it shouldn't break much because most of it is backwards compatible okay and the last thing we got here in tips tricks and bit sized awesomeness is this article the feature watch ecmascript 2020 uh, this is essentially a look at what we are gonna get in spec during the 2020 um proposal i guess draft release which will um the ecma committee usually meets up sometime in may i think so at least that's where we got the 2019 uh, version and uh, yeah there is some really good stuff here like we already have the stage four that's already in spec draft essentially you know the newish coalescing optional chaining for in mechanics global this all settles big int arbitrary precision integers import and match all which is great. And then there's a bunch of stage three, there's actually a ton of them here, which would uh, also make our life as developers quite a bit nicer. So I'm hoping that some of those stage three proposals will make it to stage four and get into the spec. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, hoping the Nullish quality, yeah, I mean, Nullish coalescing and optional chaining, uh, like the V8 already shipped them, right? Which means we're going to get them in the next version of Chrome which is, uh, when, when is it gonna come out? So we got 79 Chrome 80 release date. So they, they have the schedule, right? Uh, so it should be Chrome 81 is March, which means that Chrome 80 should come up sometime in January, I guess. Yeah, so there you go. We actually stable in 31 days, so February 4th. Okay, so there we go. So we should get Chrome 80 shipped in February 4th and then Node.js getting the latest V8. I, well, that would basically depend on the Node team, but actually, you know what, let's just check. Node.js, um, um, da, 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 GitHub. So like the thing is that the V8 with it is already released, right? It's stable already. So it basically all comes down to whenever they can uh, actually uh, added to the Node.js, which would probably be Node.js version 13. V8, uh, what was it? 8.0, I think, right? Uh, because there was the whole meme going around. Yes, V8 version 8, exactly. And I think, yes, optional chaining and nullish coalescing, exactly. So it's in V8 version 8, which means we go into the issues and we say V8, 8.0, and uh, please GitHub search, do not, oh God, okay. <laughs> 
That's, yeah, okay, update V8. Okay, let's try update V8. That seems like it's gonna be a bit better. I really hope the GitHub will roll out better search soonish because right now it's it's not very good. Uh, okay, V13.4 proposal. Um, how the hell is that worse than the previous search? Okay, can I do this? Will that work? Can you actually search properly? No, you cannot. Of course you cannot. V880. But you know what? I'm guessing it's gonna be merged soonish. So we're probably gonna get. So that's the V8 engine. There we go. We got a label for that. So maybe that will help us a bit more. And we can probably kill that and just leave the label and see what we actually have here. And uh, we need. Ah, oh, where's the open issues? Open issues and pull requests. There we go. Um, is open. Oh, come on. You. <laughs> for real? Okay, what was the label again? I think I can click from here, right? V8, V8 engine, there we go. Okay, we probably can find it somehow. V8, blah, 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 V878. Okay, this is backporting. It's just three pages, that's... Uh... I mean, there might be a chance that they already actually merged it and closed the issue, but... 6V8 version, no 12V8 version roadmap. Okay, you know what? I'm not gonna spend time on this, but uh, probably coming in the next two months maximum, I'm guessing. So we're gonna get a version 13 something with V8 being uh, already 8.0, which uh, would be pretty damn cool. Why would you update from version 8 to 7? No, I think that's not from version 8 to 7.8, as it was just update V8 to version 7.8. I think it's, I mean, the problem here is that you have the V8, which is the engine name, right? And then you have the V78, which is the version, which is confusing as hell. I totally agree with that. But they updated it to version V78, not from V8. <laughs> anyway, you know what? Let's stop with this. Let's just, let's just go back. Yeah. So if you're interested about the proposals that are currently look like they're going to make it into the uh, ECMAScript 2020, do check this article out. It's a pretty good collection. Again, links to the, uh, you know, proposals themselves, if you're curious, and the de detailed descriptions of what they actually do are included there. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, release as well, some crazy people actually released um, Ember version th 3.15 with the new Octane engine, which was teased for ages and as far as i understand it's a pretty much a game changer for the amber framework so if you're using it make sure to check it out if you are not using it uh well have a look as well they have some really neat reactivity features here that look uh pretty cool to be honest so i might dive into amber again because this actually looks pretty exciting and uh, that's basically was the only release we had like right before christmas which is even crazier but uh, there you go Okay, now we got libs and demos. Uh, the first thing we got here today is a uh, Vasm JS eval. Uh, someone went totally crazy on uh, making a safe eval. Well, I guess, I mean, <laughs> here's the question. How much safer it is really than the real one? So the way it works here is that the author took duct tape and QuickJS, which is the embeddable JavaScript engines, right? compiled it to WebAssembly and then exposed it to the uh, user through WebAssembly again, right? So you can basically import the whole damn JavaScript engine that is running in WebAssembly and then evaluate code within that engine, which gives you another layer of isolation, but I really wonder how much safer that is than just running eval in say iframe or whatever. It's a nice exercise nonetheless. So, you know, if you're looking into WebAssembly and uh, embeddable JavaScript engines in WebAssembly, which <laughs> sounds insane. I wonder if you can uh, embed another JS engine written in JS inside of the WebAssembly. You know what? Okay, what? Well, let's just stop here. Anyway, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. I think it's a really nice uh, exercise in seeing what kind of uh, WebAssembly can do basically. Uh, I wouldn't call it completely useless. Um, I can see some use cases. Like the thing is that you get a completely isolated uh, sandbox, right? That is totally clean. And in this case, doesn't even have DOM or any browser API. So it's a pure JavaScript environment. It could be useful for some cases. Again, you know, we're talking about, so in this case, if you talk about WebAssembly, we're not just talking about running it in a browser, right? So we can actually run it within Python or Java or embeddable tech. And in these cases, it becomes a bit more interesting, right? Because you no longer have to take a C, C++ code of duct tape or QuickJS and compile it to your 
preferred platform, but you can rather just take the WebAssembly version and run it there because it's basically architecture independent, right? Which is, um, to be honest, kind of neat. So, I mean, again, I don't know the use cases for that, but it's not useless by any means. All right, um, next thing we got here is Vuzik. It's a Vue.js based uh, Apple Music web player. It's essentially a demo app that shows you how you can build something like Apple Music using Vue. So if you were ever wondered how exactly does uh, something like Apple Music is made, then well, there you go. There's a source code that is uh, nearly identical to the way that Apple Player works and looks very similar. Like seems quite nice. So, you know, if you were curious how is all of that stuff works and how do you build something like this with uh, specifically Vue, Vuex, Vue Router and a SaaS, do check it out. It's actually pretty damn neat. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is NodeTube, an open source YouTube alternative that supports images and audio uploads as well, all built on top of Node.js. So if you wanted to self-host your YouTube videos for whatever reason, I like if you have unlimited bandwidth and uh, server with uh, terabytes of data maybe, there you go. It's actually uh, it looks pretty nice. It's not distributed or anything. So as you know, the self-hosted version basically, but uh, looks looks pretty damn cool. Let me have a look at the chat. Pretty similar, including bugs. I actually never used uh, Apple Music for too long because I primarily prefer Spotify, but I don't know, maybe the bugs as well. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, okay, yes, no tube. So continuing, we got IsoCity. This is a really cool one. So it's an isometric city builder in JavaScript. And by city builder, it means the basically um, it's not a builder rather than the tile editor, which is still really, really cool. So you can sort of, you know, edit your own tiny city here with roads and lampposts and uh, city in like buildings and fountains and whatever the hell you can imagine. It's really, really neat. Now, the cool thing is that the JavaScript is super tiny for that and very well written as well. So it's just basically under 200 lines, which is uh, pretty damn cool, to be honest. So the most most uh, sides of the project is actually the textures that are used uh, there to draw the whole thing. Uh, but if you are ever curious, how do you build something like this? Do check it out. It's actually a really, really cool project. Um, all right. Continuing, we got a Rhubarb, a WebSocket library optimized for multiplayer JS games that works on a web workers with binary data which uh, sounds pretty damn neat to be honest. So I I think I've played around with the WebSockets for, you know, kind of multiplayer experiences three or four times in my uh, whole life, which, you know, didn't actually end up using it in any real world projects just because of the nature of the projects I usually work with. But um, using binary data usually means that, you know, you have to transfer less and you can compress it and it's a lot more efficient. So there you go. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for your donation as usual. Highly appreciate it. Kepler, thank you for uh, telling me this. For whatever reason, I cannot hear anything. I don't know. Maybe my sound is too low because I killed it a bit too much. But uh, there you go. Anyway, continuing, we got uh, Zviterion. Uh, I, I, hell if I know how to pronounce that correctly. <laughs> So this is uh, kind of an alternative to Parcel, I guess. So it's a web server that allows you to import anything. And in this case, by anything, uh, they mean uh, JavaScript, ES 2015, TypeScript, JSON, JSX, TSX, assembly script, Rust, C, C++, WebAssembly. And then in future, they want to compile JavaScript to WebAssembly as well. The gist, the way it works is essentially the same as uh, parcel, so you create your entry point, which is, you know, index.html, for example, then you just use script to include whatever you want, and the server will essentially pre-compile this for you, be it TypeScript, be it WebAssembly. The curious parts are the Rust, C, C++ uh, pre-compilation, which sounds a bit crazy, but, um, you know, I guess it works. Uh, I'm not sure how it differs from uh, parcel. I tried to find the differences, but it's there's no like real proper comparison from either side, obviously. It is pretty new. So, you know, if you are curious about things like this, do check it out. It does look pretty interesting. Okay, continuing, we got Mesh, uh, visualize data and edit JavaScript code using spreadsheet interface. 
Uh, now this, I think it's a pretty cool uh, project. So the idea is that it's it, it's sort of like um, Excel spreadsheet, right? That allows you to write a full on JavaScript code in the cells, not just, you know, some limited mathematical functions, which might be pretty damn useful to be honest. And it's completely open source and you can try it online if you want to. Uh, which is, um, yeah, pretty damn fun. So if that sounds useful to you, do check it out. It's really cool. Again, has an online demo. If you just want to try it, you can self-host it. You can fork it, modify it, do whatever the hell you want. It actually seems really, really cool. And there's yeah also like video d uh, demos for it and deep dive on tables and the crazy stuff you can do with it, which is uh, pretty damn cool. So there you go. Okay. Right, next thing we got here is Air Trash. Uh, 100 tiny steps to build cross platform desktop apps using Electron, Node.js, and C. Now, this is not our typical you know, demo or library that we have. This is uh, essentially a tutorial. So I, I still put it here because it's a repo. But the thing is that this has literally 100 tiny steps that walk you through building your own Electron app from scratch which is really, really cool. And, you know, it's very fine grained, very tiny steps. Most of them are just like a few lines of code each, but it does guide you through the building, the whole thing. And uh, yeah, it's actually pretty good. It's not yet complete as you've seen from, you know, the end of the document It's coming, like more stuff coming soon, but it's already a pretty nice tutorial for getting started with Electron. So if you were curious, do check it out. It's actually quite good. All right. Continuing, we got JSII or JSI, I'm not, or JS2 maybe, I'm not sure how to read that correctly, but it's from the Amazon Web Services guys. Uh, it allows you uh, to code in any language, um, code in any language to naturally interact with JavaScript classes. So essentially it's a JavaScript interop for, well, any other language, which I honestly don't know when would you need to use, but it's kind of cool that you can write a class and you know, export it in JavaScript, TypeScript, whatever, and then just instantiate this class in Python, Java, or C Sharp, and work with it as if it was a native Python, Java, or C Sharp class, which sounds absolutely bonkers. And I wonder what the performance implications are, but it, it just looks amazing. <laughs> so if you have a use case in mind where you could import your existing JavaScript code into Python, Java, or .NET, do check this out. It's actually pretty damn cool. Like it's very impressive. And again, it's backed by Amazon. So it's probably going to be around for quite some time. I probably should start it as well because it's a really cool project. Hey, Scalderia, welcome to the stream. Yes, finally a live stream. I know it's been <laughs> quite a while, but I should be back on track with my normal schedule uh, starting this week, basically. Okay, continuing, we got promise all reject late, a really neat tiny utility that uh, behaves like promise all, but saves all rejections until all promises are resolved in some manner, which uh, I mean, I guess, you know, in most cases, this won't be super helpful, but in some cases, like for example, writing files, you do want to do that uh, kind of stuff again, right? So for example, save all the files. If the file was written correctly, then it's fine. If not, then we need to remove that file, for example, right, which could be quite a nice use case. So if you're working with promises a lot, and you have cases for something like this, do check it out It's actually quite good. All right. Next thing we got here is one click JS one click offline common JS modules in browser. Now this is a proof of concept more than anything. Uh, if I remember correctly, at least this is what I remember reading in on Twitter, yeah, there you go. Do not use this in production. This is basically for uh, local developments. The idea is that you can uh, use this one click thing and it will bootstrap your um, modules and allow you to require common JS modules right from your browser. Uh, the way it works is a bit insane. So if you're curious, do check out the whole details in the description. It's actually really, really cool. But yeah, it's hacky as hell, but it actually works. And it's uh, quite nice to just, you know, being able to require your common JS stuff from uh, local node modules folders without um, actually setting up parcels or whatever. Um, and it's very easy to get started. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Maybe this is your next uh, prototyping tool for the local offline development. Right, uh, next thing we got here is Hippie. This is a cross-platform framework designed for web developers 
from Tencent. So essentially the way I saw it, it's basically uh, React Native, but from Tencent. It's also built using uh, C, C++, uh, Java, Objective-C, and you know, it's compiles for the mobile devices, desktop, and uh, basically everything as far as I understood. Now, my problem with it is that it doesn't really have um, documentation just yet. Like the docs they have are very sparse and the ones that they have are in Chinese, which, you know, makes it, um, doesn't make it a lot easier to work with it basically, but the framework actually looks really interesting. So at least from the images I've seen, it looks pretty cool. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how that develops, whether they will uh, translate it to English the they do have the example apps code here so for ios and raid uh, the ios android uh, and web in this case um the interesting thing is it actually supports react and view as the front end technology so you can actually pick whichever you like more and it still compiles to the native interface which is uh, pretty damn cool so if that sounds interesting do check it out again beware that you know the documentation is um, a bit sparse but it does look quite interesting it will be interesting to see if they can uh, basically rival the React Native. Uh, well, in some cases, it would be interesting to see the, you know, the benchmarks, comparisons, stuff like this. A bit hard to do that without the documentation, but uh, hopefully they will add it at some point a bit later. Okay, next thing we got here is Fuse Native. Uh, somebody did a multi-threaded Fuse bindings for Node.js. Uh, so Fuse is the file system, um, what do you call it? I remember this is a file system, something FuseFS. Uh, file system and user space, exactly. There you go. Uh, it's used usually in the Linux or in Mac OS for well, different file system stuff. I think I used it once or twice in my life for some weird, obscure things I needed to set up. But uh, maybe you know the use cases. So if you do, now you can literally use that from Node.js. You can you know work with the file system from Node.js, which is uh, crazy on its own. And uh, there you go. That one rep I was helping is and had translate every piece of text because we're mostly in Chinese. Uh, it's really cool. You know, like I have nothing but respect for people who spend time translating stuff into English. And it's like, it's cool enough that they open source the framework as it is, right? But if it, it will, like the problem, uh, okay, so let me, let me try to phrase that. So here's the thing, we have React Native, which is an incredible piece of tech that allows you to go into the mobile and desktop world right now by just knowing JavaScript. Obviously, you still have to understand how the mobiles work. Obviously, you still have to understand the inner workings of the platform, OS, native bindings, and all that stuff. But the speed to market when you are a JavaScript developer is a lot faster than what you have if you're just a native dev, right? It's, they just speed up you a lot. And Tencent built their own framework because something was lacking from React Native, right? So I'm, I'm really, really curious to see the story behind it. Why it was built, what kind of advantages does it have over React Native, what kind of disadvantages does it have over React Native. And uh, well, right now it's all of that is not there, right? So I'll be very curious to see if Tencent kind of pushes it further or if they just leave it as is open source and forget about it, essentially just use it for their internal projects. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a really cool notion anyway that, you know, this, we're getting more and more open source from like very big guys like Tencent, Amazon, and everyone else basically, because this is, this is awesome. But anyway, continuing, we got uh, 2220. I, on, I have no idea what that means, but it's a self-hosted internet with an offline archives. So the idea is that you run this thing locally and uh, you point your uh, browser to this thing as a proxy, right? And then every request you do to it, it will dump locally and make a local copy of it so you can browse it offline or browse the history if you want. It's a really nice project, but I personally don't see myself using it. <laughs> If that sounds really interesting, do check it out by all means. But I just, you know, as a, as a person who doesn't care much about archiving, well, just about anything, aside from backups for critical stuff, I just don't see myself using something like it. But it's a really nice archivist browser controller, as it says. So uh, there you go. All right. Last thing we got in demos is probably the most awesome demo of the week. Um, it is a web, a web like, uh, let me let me try that again. It's a web radio. 
like this is a physical radio that is probably somewhere in the Netherlands, I guess, by judging by dot nl. And you got this band and you can literally search it and listen to the radio signals. I have it muted right now because it's really, really damn loud, but it's a full on radio that you can use, you can search and you can, like you can even get the spectrograms, which is freaking insane. I uh, was having something like this in my university during the courses where we studied radio would be freaking amazing. Just look at this, like they've, there's even like titles here. This is just crazy. So if you ever wanted to play with a radio, but you know, don't have a proper real radio, then do check this one out. It's actually really, really cool. And there's also like a bunch of settings and tweaks and there's like users here in chat box where you can talk to people who use it as well. And there's login stations and it has even an S meter here. Okay, this, this thing is crazy basically. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's actually really, really awesome. Okay, and before we wrap this up, um, I wanted to highlight uh, just javascript.com. Uh, the new book by, or I guess, work in progress book by Dan Abramov. So essentially he is writing a book or a course uh, on JavaScript that is called Just JavaScript. And it's going to be his mental model of how JavaScript works and how you can basically learn it. And you can basically join uh, right now to learn it absolutely for free by giving your feedback, which uh, actually sounds really cool. And uh, when I was seeing it, I thought that I should really uh, finish up my video course as well, because I've been sitting on it for two or three years now, and I should really just get it done. But yeah, um, there we go. That's basically it from my side for today. So if you have any questions or suggestions or links that I might have missed, throw it into the chat right now. Uh, if not, then, you know, we can just uh, finish up here. Meanwhile, you can, as usual, you can find all the links on GitHub uh, or on bxjs.dev. There is no bot here. I am absolutely terrible at um, doing Twitch. So I'm just going to be a bot myself. There you go. Have a link. <laughs> it is really short. As I said, you know, I mean, it was holiday. So people are still, I think, on vacations. They're still resting and there's not that many links, um, uh, you know, Nothing new really happens. Everyone is just coming back to work. Uh, hopefully next week we're going to get more stuff to talk about. Maybe new Node.js version with uh, V8 version 8 with newish coalescing and optional chaining. I'm just going to rewrite half of my repos to use that. Uh, but yeah. So yeah, in addition to the links, we also have a Discord server where you can join and talk about JavaScript, ask your questions if you need help or talk to us about video games because we do that as well. Um, there's probably going to be more of the development streams, uh, this year, at least I will try, certainly try to do that. I am also going to try to stream more video games, but we're going to see about that. So if you are interested in this kind of stuff, uh, do follow the Twitch channel. There's, um, if you missed, there's going to be a VOD available on Twitch immediately or on YouTube in the next couple of hours, once I re-upload that. And, uh, yeah, that's basically it. Right, so it doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. It was a very short one, uh, but again, you know, first thing of a year, not that much stuff happening. But nonetheless, I hope you found something interesting. Um, yeah, enjoy your rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you are watching the VOD of this. Uh, see you on Discord if you are there and uh, have a nice evening. Bye.